Hello. Hello. Welcome to the Musée des Hommes Berliner. And welcome, uh, Louis, that you could make it here from uh, Arc Montreal. That's right. Well, we're here inaugurating the first ever Montreal basement tape today. On yep. inaugure le premier jour, journée des trouvailles sonores. Des trouvailles, des choses uh, qu'on. On a trouvé dans des bandes de garage, dans des dons uh, reçus par les organismes. This is basically found sounds. Basement tapes are, uh, basement tapes day has started in Los Angeles and, and it's all about celebrating um, the forgotten or lost sounds on various old formats, old cassettes, old, all, all kinds of formats that you'll see uh, today during the presentation. Um, yes, and here at the Musée des Landes de Berliner. The Musée des Anglais de Berliner is a museum in the heart of St. Henry in Montreal. We are all about sound, sound recording, and uh, everything that has to do with electromagnetic wires. Behind me, you see what we will present today. This is uh, a radio record player for transcript disc. Um, we are here in the room of our temporary exhibition, which is celebrating 100 years of radio broadcast in Montreal. This is part of a larger project, uh, the centennial of the broadcasting in Canada. We are very fortunate that we can uh, host this event uh, thanks to, uh, to subventions of the federal government of uh, Canada. We also got uh, supported by the Trottier Foundation, the Casse du Jardin, uh, the City of Montreal, the Société Québécois des Collectionneurs des Radio Anciennes. They are also collaborators of this first ever Montreal Basement Tapes Day. All right. I'm going to say a few words about what our organization is, Arc Montreal. Um, I'm, and then I will pass it over back to uh, Anya, where we have a little video showing a bit more about what the Musée des Hommes did. So Arc Montreal, ARCMTL, uh, we have, um, we're a very interesting nonprofit organization that does arts promotion and then preservation, uh, but not just the arts. Uh, basically, uh, we're a nonprofit that promotes um, independent artists, musicians. Uh, we have a radio show on the community radio. We also promote the recent heritage and history of the city's arts and music scene and culture scenes. Uh, but by doing so, we also focus a lot on what we call ephemeral material. So when it relates to the arts and the music scene, for example, we um, gather up a lot of things from garage sales or, or rescue old items from um, radio stations as far as recordings, but also we are very, um, uh, we, we, we value things like posters, flyers, old programs, things that are generally thrown out. And when we started our archive about 20 years ago, uh, we made a point of collecting these sorts of things that a lot of institutions don't, at the time anyway, never bothered collecting. Um, in fact, uh, after doing so for the music and art scene, uh, it's very easy to also gather up all kinds of other ephemeral material. It all kind of looks the same, old business cards, matchbooks, and like I mentioned, old recordings of various types. Uh, a main reason why we buy and, and pick up and, uh, garage sales and wherever we find boxes of reels, boxes of videos, boxes of old cassettes and formats, it's mainly for our mandate to promote, to try to preserve the Montreal arts and culture scene. We find a lot of uh, concert footage, people who filmed uh, events, uh, often a box of tapes will have recordings of uh, uh, original recordings from a musician or recordings from radio programs that are not available anywhere else and never got archived. But we also find a lot of weird and fun stuff and that's kind of what we're going to be uh, focusing on more today on this uh, basement tapes day. Que la journée des trouvailles sonores, on va mettre la face sur nos collections un peu étranges, des choses qu'on ramasse qui sont un peu mystérieuses et qui contiennent beaucoup de surprises. Donc voilà, on va faire un événement un petit peu en français, mais principalement en anglais. Mais si jamais euh, vous voulez euh, des questions et ainsi de suite par chat euh, sur le Zoom, euh, c'est bien possible aussi. So yeah. that's um, just as another introduction, uh, people can chat and ask questions on the Zoom. I think we've uh, added some time at the end for some questions too. And yeah. English or French, both is possible. We are pretty bilingual. Both organizations yeah. are serving the public in both official languages. Yeah. Um, shall I say a little bit about what we have at the Musée des Andes yeah. in the sound recording? Because uh, while we are principally more interested in the technology, we have uh, by now a large collection of recordings. We have a lot of uh, music recording, of course. The Musée des Andes Emi Berliner is in the old factory of Emi Berliner, the inventor of the record uh, player, so to speak. So the gramophone and the disc with a lateral cut. 
We are currently with around 25,000 records and a part of these records are so-called transcript discs. There are roughly three to 400 uh, records. They are um, these large 16 inch records, which we cannot play on normal record players. So um, we need the special equipment, which uh, we are lucky to have. We also have uh, weird um, formats that uh, are quite unusual by now, and uh, we try to cover every aspect. But we are not uh, really a music collection like the ARC MTL. Uh, MTL. So we are complementing each other. Oh, I can take off my mask so you can see the full beauty of myself. Um, it's also easier to speak. <laughs> so we are very happy that uh, this year we can uh, feature some aspect of radio. Radio is often um, something so common that we don't really understand that radio was and is still quite ephemeral. So when we do not record a radio show, it's actually one time and then it's lost forever. We have figured out that the first, or we have uh, revealed that the first radio program that was uh, recorded in Canada is actually not uh, from the very first days, but it's uh, coming from 19. 24. So it took roughly four years before somebody attempted to really record radio. That makes the recording of programs quite special because um, we are really capturing just uh, little aspects of radio that uh, usually are lost in time once the programming has ended. As I understand, there is a video that shows a little bit of the Musée des Ondes uh, that we produced in the last days. So I would uh, think that is a good time to yeah. play that. So uh, this is uh, part of our displays that we have in the showcases and the publicly accessible um, corridors. This is in our temp uh, permanent exhibition. The permanent exhibition is a bit of a project in the making. Uh, it's uh, constantly changing, which makes it uh, quite dynamic. We try to show um, aspects of the history of the building and the companies that were um, uh, using the building from the Berliner to the Victor talking machine to RCA Victor. It goes further than after RCA Victor into the space technology. Here we see some of the very old technologies, the phonograph and uh, one of the first commercially ex um, uh, sold um, gramophones. And um, it's a modest museum, but with the depths of the history, we are actually quite uh, impressive. We are in the old building of the RCA. So this is the outside of the museum, which is in a building part that was built in the 1920s and then um, modified in the 1960s. In the back you see, oh, I can actually see where I am. So I can sit here. Um, and uh, it is a historically really important part of uh, Montreal history. This is now in our collection room where we found the wire recorder that uh, you will uh, later see in one of the demonstrations. So it's a lot of fun to move those uh, shelves. That's quite new to us. We are constantly improving the museum to bring it up to uh, museum standards. We are, however, mostly uh, uh, volunteer based. So we need to make sure that the volunteers are also um, feeling comfortable that they get uh, some uh, fun experience out of it and that we keep space for them in uh, inside of this uh, fairly um, small museum. So we are at the end of the presentation and I hope that you got a little bit of an insight and uh, got some uh, somehow curious to visit us. We are open uh, usually outside of COVID of course from uh, Monday to Sunday we have some uh, uh, opening um, restrictions during COVID, but uh, the office hours and the museum opening hours you can find usually in the social media and on the, on the Google. So I don't want to talk too much about that because um, we never know how it's now developing. So uh, inform yourself and we are very happy to uh, then have visitors as soon as we are allowed to, again. There is um, now time 
to switch over to the um, basement tapes uh, day team in Los Angeles. Are they already available? Yes, hello. There, I hey. hear somebody. <laughs> this is Yuri. Hey. Hi. Good morning from Los Angeles. Good afternoon there in Montreal. Uh, Miles is here too. Hi, can you see me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Hello again. Um, Miles and I are so happy to be joining you today. Um, and we're so excited to be a part of the inaugural uh, Montreal Basement Tapes Day. Uh, I think we just wanted to um, kind of give some insights into how we um, started the event. Uh, Miles and I um, were both volunteers at Home Movie Day for several years. And in 2018, uh, we kind of decided, why can't we have something like this for audio? Um, Miles, do you want to say hello to everyone and kind of give some insights into how we started the event? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. We're very happy to see that this event is um, replicating not only across the country, but across the world. So hello to our friends in the border. Um, the movie theater in DC is better these days, so we hope it's better up there too. Um, and um, we came up with this idea, as Yuri said, when we were um, interns together at the Library of Congress's uh, Audiovisual Conservation Center. And um, it seemed like the framework was already there for this event from uh, the Home Movie Day um, event, which we had been participants in. And um, it's, you know, it's kind of taken off just as we hoped it would. And um, we want people to replicate this event and do put their own um, leadership and the flavor of their archive and their own local communities into the event. And um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, and I think our goals have always been the same no matter where the event is taking place. Of course, first and foremost is to give um, you know members of the public access to the recordings that might have been sitting in their closets or in their attics uh, for years. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID this year, um, our focus really had to shift to our other goals of um, providing the public with uh, a glimpse kind of behind the scenes into what we do as archivists every day, what happens in an archive library or museum behind the scenes to preserve um, items like uh, sound recordings to kind of demystify the process of um, preserving these items, not just physically, but um, you know, in storage like Anya had showed the shelving in um, the museum, but also through digitization and um, getting to expose people to what playback equipment looks like, what the process, um, what takes place during the process. And this year, I feel like we were able to kind of really highlight um, engineers like Lenise Bent, who is also on the call and said hello in the, in the chat. She is one of our volunteer um, audio engineers who is the one that actually sits with the tapes, um, gets to listen to the recordings as they're being digitized. Um, and this year she was able to actually interact with a lot of our event uh, participants, um, which I think was, um, you know, kind of emotional and really beautiful to see that, that interaction take place. Um, and as Miles said, we're really excited that um, the event is spreading around the globe um, in addition to Montreal, I, I know you're going to hear from the Toronto Basement Tapes Day folks after us, um, and uh, two sites in England took part in Basement Tapes Day as um, part of UNESCO's World Heritage Day on October 27th. Um, they had live tape listening sessions and also um, kind of gave behind the scenes tours of their digitization labs, which was really cool to see. Um, yeah, thank you again for having us. Miles, do you want to talk about maybe some of our future goals? Um, yeah, I, I mean, going 
going back a little bit to um, the pedagogy of events and the intent, um, we really want to highlight the whole ecology of sound from someone's living room to the archive and then back to the living room and how you know people document uh, their family moments um, in audio and how these can be important historical documents and the importance of preserving them, digitizing and um, revisiting them in, in today's um, framework. So um, what did you ask me? <laughs> <laughs> um, if you wanted to just give any insights into what we have planned for the future. Well, we, yeah, I mean, we're hoping um, that once the pandemic is um, at a safe, under control level, if that, um, well, that will happen. But <laughs> we're hoping that once that happens, uh, to have in-person events. And, um, you know, we had to, of course, adapt to a virtual event this year, like everyone is, and like you are in here in Montreal. Um, but, I mean, there's just a, a huge diversity of, of options that may present themselves uh, with in-person. Um, it within libraries and archives, or even in the larger social sphere of the community. Um, so, whatever people think of, it's also a game of and, uh, The more diversity of uh, aesthetics for this kind of event, uh, the stronger, the more interesting it will be, and probably more fruitful and popular um, worldwide. So. Yeah, we're really excited to um, see the rest of the day's program. And um, I think that is kind of one of the most beautiful things to us is to see how each city kind of um, infuses their own flavor into the events. Um, as Miles said, in adapting to a virtual environment this year, I think, um, again, the notion of community was so important we wouldn't be able to carry off any of these events if our um, other community partners and community members didn't band together and offer their time and energy into planning the events and executing it. Um, and so if you are interested in um, kind of creating a Basement Tapes Day event in your community, please feel free to reach out to us. I put, um, I'm going to put our email address into the chat to everyone. Um, if you have any questions or maybe want to see if there's other people um, in your area that are interested in doing a Basement Tapes Day, um, we're happy to help facilitate that, put you in contact with other people that might have already um, expressed an interest to us. Uh, because you know, for Miles and I, the more the event spreads, um, the better, um, because unfortunately we can't be in multiple places around the globe um, to host the events ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, like we said, I think the, the beauty of it will be to see how each event is going to be different and I love how today's event is really embracing the centennial of radio um, in Canada. Um, and yeah, I think that's it, unless you have more to add. I, well, you know, on a, on a positive note, I think that um, the virtualization that everyone has to adapt to um, is actually positive for growing something like this kind of movement because it's actually easier to do something in your center and just have a couple video cameras and have people hook in to Zoom. Um, and so, I, I, you know, as we move forward, obviously more in person is the goal, but um, there are silver linings to difficult situations such as this. And we're really grateful that everyone's like being creative and finding uh, solutions for difficult scenarios, especially something that's in its uh, inception stage. So. Very happy to yeah, so enjoy the day. Um, have fun learning about uh, the collections at Arc Montreal and the Musee uh, Emile Berliner. Um, and thank you to the events host for inviting us to say hi 
to everyone. Um, and again, feel, please feel free um, to reach out to us with any questions or um, interest in the event. Um, you know, some people I think have also reached out to us with questions about digitizing their own collections at home. Um, and we're always happy to um, either answer the questions or point you to um, digitization vendors in your communities. Um, yeah, so I think we can turn things over to the Toronto contingency. Um, but thank you for having us, Anya. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm Liz, I'm from Tiny um, in Toronto. Toronto, um, uh, sorry, Tiny was involved with the Toronto Basement Tapes Day in October. And uh, Tiny stands for the Toronto Information Network of Independent Music Cooperative. Um, we are a collectively organized group of musicians, archivists, and musicians. Um, so the, the, the mission of Tiny is twofold. Um, it's to document independent music archives and provide peer-to-peer -peer resources and professional services to musicians. Um, and it's also to establish a charitable mandate to document and preserve threatened independent archives of significant music properties that would otherwise be neglected by the commercial cultural sector. Um, so right now we're compiling a list of resources and intend to be involved with other basement tapes day um, till the end of the year. Um, it's sort of an ongoing interest we have in digital preservation and um, sort of also looking at um, records that are or music or files or whatever that are born digital and might uh, might not be uh, operable now anyway. There's a lot of obsolescence and a lot of, you know, where you have some, not on a floppy disk, you wouldn't record, but I'm just, that's a bad example, but a born digital musical file that maybe you don't have the right software to access or, or what. Um, so I can play you um, some examples from our basement tape stay in Toronto. Um, so um, we sort of use some uh, samples from the archivists involved with Tiny, Simon and Curtis. And uh, one of them was uh, just um, audio recordings from uh, cassette tape from an answering machine. Um, so I can play some of that for you if you want, or I'm not sure if, actually, let me make sure it'll play. Um, I found it pretty cool. I'm gonna try this one more time. I just changed the output. Peace out. All right, Beth. There we go. I don't know, can you hear Bonjour. that? Bonjour. Bell Canada vous informe qu'un dérangement de votre ligne téléphonique a été signalé récemment. Le dérangement a été réparé le 26. <laughs> Yo, Curtis, it's Bennett. Uh, it's now like 9.30 on a Wednesday. Just call to see if you're interested in going out. If so, give me a ring. Is that audible? Five, eight, two, four. Talk to you later. Hey, Curtis. Uh, David, we're calling. I'm just double checking to make sure you got me a ticket for that J5 show because I got to go down and get my room. <laughs> I don't know well, if you can hear this, but anyway, this is an example of the basement tape stay in Toronto. So if you just call me whenever you message you. That'd be awesome. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Have a good day. Take a look at Steve. It's uh, my answer for. Anyway, um... I don't know if you have any questions for me. I know we only have five minutes, but, but I just wanted to play you some samples from, from that day. I think that seems pretty good. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot. We'll hope to connect for the next basement tape today as well. Great. And hopefully there will be many to come. Yeah. All right, well, we're not uh, muted anymore. We can talk? Yeah. 
So thanks, first of all, um, to Yuri and Miles from LA and Liz from Toronto. We are very excited that we are part of this uh, um, new adventure. The next point that we have in the basement, basement tape stay is a presentation that we have prepared here at the Musée des Ondes. I will um, let um, Jean Marcotte do the presentation so that he can take his mask off. So I will move out of the picture. And uh, Jean, you might uh, like to come here and explain a little bit what we are um, having here. Okay, hi everybody. So the goal of this presentation is to be able to listen to what's on those uh, 16 inches uh, transcription discs. Fait le but de la présentation, c'est de pouvoir euh, écouter ce qu'il y a sur ces disques euh, d'enregistrement d'émissions radio qui ont 16 pouces de diamètre et qui demandent un équipement spécial. Uh, from uh, the labels I have here, I have three discs that uh, gives you a biography of Louis Saint-Laurent, which was the Prime Minister of Canada from 1948 to 1957. And those... Uh, Recordings date back from uh, June 1949, between the 1st of June and the 15th of June 1949. We have five of those uh, broadcasts, and the broadcast would last 15 minutes each, and were broadcasted on station CKVL in Montreal between 9.30 and 9.45 9 p.m. So uh, to, in order to be able to uh, listen to this record, we need, of course, a turntable able to take the record. Alors, comme je disais en anglais, l'étiquette euh, nous montre que ce sont c'est la biographie de Louis Saint Laurent qui est racontée dans des émissions de 15 minutes qui ont été euh, émises par la station CKVL entre le 1er juin et le 15 juin 1949. Okay, so if we go back, if we go to the turntable here, the, we needed to find one that was able to take the format. And first, we dug this one out of the basement, which is a McCurdy turntable that was used in a radio station in Montreal until it closed and uh, was given to the museum in 2008. It, uh, it can play uh, all uh, three current speed, 33, 45, and 78 RPM. It has two arms, as you can see, because in the radio stations, you would not keep changing the needles and everything when you change from 78 to the other format. So the arm on the right had the cartridge and needle for 33 and 45 RPM discs, and the one in the back was used for 78 RPM discs. That was easier this way. Now, when we tried the, uh, initially, when we tried the 16 inch uh, disc on it, I realized that it didn't quite fit. We were missing a bit. So it was not designed for 16 inches. It was designed for 12 inches. Plus. But a very simple modification, just moving the uh, arm support 180 degrees on each side, gave me enough room to put the 16 inches discs on them. La table tournante que nous allons utiliser, euh, c'était une table tournante qui était dans une station de radio de Montréal euh, au début des années, date des années 60, et euh, est capable de jouer les trois vitesses 33, 45 et 78 tours. Euh, on peut voir que la table euh, deux bras. Et euh, le bras de droite était là avec une cartouche qui était prévue pour les euh, 33 et 45 euh, tours. Et le bras derrière servait pour euh, lire les 78 tours. Comme ça, on n'avait pas besoin de changer les aiguilles, changer les cartouches à chaque euh, disque. OK, now, uh, all this equipment here up front is uh, not working. So we had to uh, plug directly the cartridge into a uh, brand, uh, brand new 1980 stereo system with uh, brand new 70, uh, 1970 speaker to go with the 1960 turntable. But all from the basement, we had to find working things. That's what I found this morning. So let's do it now. So I'm going to put the record on. It fits nicely. Start the turntable. And we're going to listen to what's on it. Mesdames, Messieurs, nous disions hier en terminant, c'est le chrétien qui, au seuil de la vie, a fermement implanté en lui-même Louis Saint-Laurent de façon inattaquable et irréductible la volonté d'être un témoin pour accomplir sa destinée 
En se dégageant des contingences matérielles, en développant ce qui est en lui, en progressant vers le parfait idéal de rédempteur. Tout le reste est sans importance. Et c'est ce que comprend l'enfant de Compton instinctivement. Il n'avait pas besoin de livre pour apprendre cela. Si Louis Saint-Laurent n'avait pas passé par le collège et l'université, sans doute il ne serait pas avocat. Et presque certainement il ne serait pas premier ministre. Mais cela ne lui aurait rien enlevé à sa valeur d'homme de chrétien. Cela ne lui aurait pas enlevé ce qu'il savait parfaitement à l'air de son temps. We're not listening. We're not going to listen to all of it. Ce qu'on vient d'écouter, c'était justement une des parties de l'enregistrement. J'expliquais tout à l'heure que l'appareil lui-même a été branché directement dans des, des appareils plus modernes pour pouvoir euh, le jouer parce que la partie électronique de la machine ici est hors service pour l'instant. Uh, another thing I found out on those records is uh, that uh, on the 16 inches records, which are 33 RPM and speed, We have four of those broadcast, and the fifth one is on the 12-inch uh, record. And funny enough, this one is 78 RPM. So we're going to play it also, just to show you the difference. Alors, les quatre premières émissions qu'on avait étaient sur un disque de 16 pouces, euh, une émission par côté. Et la cinquième émission, curieusement, du 9 juin, est sur un disque 12 pouces, 78 tours que j'avais joué à l'instant. Un tout bon vieux disque, il y a des problèmes. N'anticipons pas, car nous y reviendrons plus tard pour expliquer ce que M. Saint-Laurent appelle la paix de Compton, dont il est la cause. Ici se place un événement d'importance mondiale qui influa sur la destinée du grand-père maternel Stephen Brothers. La Californie, qui dépendait du Mexique, venait d'être cédée aux États-Unis. Deux ans après la session, en 1848, un mécanicien découvrit des paillettes d'or au bas d'une chute d'eau qui lui constituait une sirène. La nouvelle se répète. So, you can see the You can see the difference. The sound is uh, quite clearer on this one than on the 33 RPM. That's because the needle on the cartridge is not designed for uh, long play. It's designed for 78 RPM discs. Comme on a pu voir, le son est meilleur sur le disque 12 pouces, 78 tours, parce que l'aiguille qui est sur la cartouche est prévue pour ce genre de disque-là, alors que sur le, le long jeu, la carte de la on a moins de haut parce que la l'aiguille est plus grande et va moins en profondeur dans le disque. Alors, en ce qui me concerne, c'était tout. Fait que je donne la parole. OK. Euh, bon, on me demande ici d'expliquer que sur certains disques 16 pouces, comme ça, on a des... Euh, Celui-là ne l'a pas, mais on en a d'autres à l'arrière qui sont marqués... Euh, 33 tours, 78 tours, in et out. Parce que certains de ces disques-là, dépendant des appareils et de l'enregistrement, étaient enregistrés du centre vers l'extérieur, alors que celui-là et ceux qu'on vient de jouer sont de l'extérieur vers le centre. Le pourquoi de ça, je ne saurais pas l'expliquer, mais ce euh, serait intéressant d'en some... avoir un pour faire la démonstration. Je ne crois pas qu'on en ait. On me dit ici, celui-là me dit ici que start inside. Ça fait qu'on va essayer la chose, effectivement. C'est un 33 tours. Okay, as I was explaining in French, uh, apparently some, uh, some of those uh, 16 inches records were recorded from the inside out instead of from outside in. So we just found one here. We're going to try it to see if it's uh, really the case. It's 
seems to be working. Okay, so you can't actually see it, but the, the needle is really going outwards towards the what would be the beginning normally of a disc. Okay, that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you all for watching. Thanks, Jean-Marco. The next uh, part is a pre-recorded video by Alain Dufour. Alain Dufour is uh, part of the team of the MOEB. He is a president. Uh, he is a member of the board of directors, but he is president also of the Société Québécoise des Collectionneurs de Radio Ancienne. He has produced uh, four um, record uh, pre-recorded uh, sessions that uh, we will play. Um, uh, as part of the program, and I think we is ready to play the first. Yeah. Donc, je voulais vous parler d'un certain nombre de formats d'enregistrement magnétique qui sont déjà obsolètes. Euh, tout le monde, bien sûr, connaît la bobine euh, d'enregistrement sur bande magnétique de euh, un quart de pouce de dont le ruban mesure un quart de pouce. Euh, beaucoup de personnes connaissent aussi la petite cassette compacte de Philips, qui a été introduite au début des années 60, on pense vers 1963, mais peu de gens savent qu'antérieurement, il y avait eu aussi une cassette similaire, mais au lieu d'avoir un ruban de un huitième de pouce, on avait un ruban d'un quart de pouce, donc la même largeur de ruban que sur une bobine traditionnelle. Et euh, ces cassettes-là, par contre, nécessitaient d'être embobinées, rendues à la fin, tandis qu'on a eu un certain nombre de cassettes sans fin, comme la cassette Cousino, de format de 3 à 6 minutes environ, et sa grande sœur, euh, euh, qui s'appelait aussi Cousino, mais qui s'appelait Cousino Tapette, sur lequel on pouvait mettre l'équivalent d'un album, euh, d'un long jeu, finalement, et qui sont des boucles sans fin. Ainsi que la cassette 8 pistes qui a été très populaire euh, en Amérique du Nord, euh, qui était souvent utilisée dans les automobiles parce que c'était facile d'utilisation, et sa petite sœur qui était euh, une cassette de 4 pistes et non pas 8, sur laquelle on pouvait mettre seulement 4 chansons en mono ou deux chansons en stéréo. Et il y a eu aussi pour une courte période de temps le mini-disque qui est aussi un enregistrement magnétique euh, qui a été introduit par Sony au début des années 90 et qui est devenu obsolète dès 2003. Sony a arrêté la production parce que les MP3 avaient pris tout le marché. Et un autre média dont on va parler, ce sont les enregistrements sur fil magnétique. Donc ici, c'est un, un peu de, de fil que j'ai sorti d'une bobine. Hein. Euh, on va voir comment ça fonctionne. Donc on va regarder surtout les cassettes Cousineau et les bobines de fil magnétique. Alors, puisque celle-ci veut se décrocher, nous allons le faire dès maintenant. Everything is good. Oh, hey. All right. Well, uh, I guess I can take my mask off. Je vais enlever mon masque pour uh, parler un petit peu plus clairement. Um, cette fois-ci, j'ai décidé de vous amener et de vous présenter des formats un peu en lien avec ce que M. Dufour vient juste de présenter. 
Euh, c'est des formats adaptés pour l'usage de la radio. Euh, decided to bring in some radio-related found sounds, and literally found sounds. This is stuff that uh, is kind of excavated and rescued from uh, literally the uh, to throw out bin of a radio station. Um, as you saw in the presentation of Mr. Dufour, a lot of the, um, basically the history of radio advertising begins with several decades of people just uh, plugging the sponsors in person. The radio DJ or the host would say, we'd like to take a moment to thank a cigarette company or whoever it was in the 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s. Um, it was really in the 40s when the beginning of the acetate type disc um, and uh, uh, customizable um, records like acetates that uh, people started pre-recording um, uh, radio advertisements and letting the DJs play the advertisement on the record. Uh, by the 50s, uh, various tapes were introduced, 50s and early 60s, as Mr. Dufour mentioned, um, the idea of creating an infinite loop tape, which means that it starts and ends at the same spot, uh, really sort of revolutionized advertising on radio. Uh, quand le, uh, les cassettes sans fin, telles que mentionnées par M. Dufour, ont été uh, inventées, c'était vraiment parfait pour l'usage de la radio pour des annonces. Pourquoi? Parce que c'est le temps de jouer telle ou telle annonce, numéro 32, le DJ le prend, le met dans la machine et ça joue automatiquement. The way all of these infinite loop tapes uh, worked, similar to what you may have remembered if you had a cassette answering machine in the 80s or 90s, they would sell these little one-minute tapes that would go around and come back to where they started from to play your message. It's the same thing with the radio advertisements. The minute you um, play it, uh, you put it in, it plays. Uh, I'm just going to switch to show you These are machines that, for the most part, were built in the 60s and possibly into the 70s. Um, they were made to last, but after 50 years or so, uh, they need a bit of, of work. Uh, the video there, this is me the other day, uh, trying to bring this machine back to life. There was a lot of dirt on those heads, a lot of uh, cracks on the rubber, and actually there was no sound coming out of any of them at first. So I did have to do uh, quite the uh, operation to get it fixed up. Il y avait vraiment beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup d'usage sur ces choses-là. C'est des machines quand même qui jouaient des cassettes très, très souvent et un peu brutalement la façon qu'ils fonctionnent. Donc voilà. I don't want to skip to the next video on the thing. Je vais vous montrer. J'ai pas pu amener la machine pour vous jouer live ici. I wasn't able to bring the machine to play it live during this presentation. It would be the next one. Je vous explique un peu pourquoi uh, j'ai pas pu amener la machine. Le volume est très, 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 très bas sur so, uh, la machine qui joue la cartouche. Uh, malgré mes efforts de la nettoyer, il uh, y a pas beaucoup de son qui sort. Fait que there's not a lot of sound coming out of those very, very old heads on this uh, card player. So I had to put it through, as we often do at our archive for uh, old uh, recordings, uh, cassettes and material that has faded over time. I ran it through a big power amp at top volume, I'm talking 350 watt uh, Pioneer. Um, I routed the uh, preamp out to a Zoom device, which I also had to set at maximum to be able to capture and listen to some of these carts. J'ai dû passer la machine uh, dans un stéréo uh, assez fort, avec le volume au maximum, et uh, le numériser avec une machine Zoom uh, avec le volume au maximum aussi, juste pour avoir un petit peu de son. Uh, je vais maintenant vous en jouer. We're just going to play. Some of these, as you can see in the footage there, you just stick the um, cartridge in and off with holes. Uh, I'm going to reshare so I can hear the sound. Black Sabbath, avec les quatre membres fondateurs, Ozzy Osbourne, Tony Iommi, Cheezer Butler et Billy Ward, tous réunis sur la scène du Centre Molson le dimanche 22 août. Black Sabbath, avec en première partie Godsmack et Drain STH. 
Billet en bord au centre Bolson sur admission ou au 790-1245. Production Donald K. Donald Universal. Um, radio ad on the cartridge from 1998 for a local uh, Montreal Black Sabbath concert. Um, there was another one that I would like to play, but the sound really didn't come out very well. Uh, we had occasion to dig into some of the archives here at the Musée des Ondes de Now, and um, I'll try to post it separately in some other way, or maybe when we put the archive of this event up. But it's actually an ad from uh, La Fête du Saint-Jean, quelque part dans les années 70. La ville d'Asbestos et la compagnie Beton Asbestos qui vous souhaite un bon Saint-Jean uh, avec un produit québécois. Uh, basically, it was an ad for asbestos concrete, concrete with asbestos in it, from the city of Asbestos, wishing you a happy national uh, fête nationale de Québec uh, and underlining the fact that it's a proudly Quebec product. Um, it's a bit timely because it's only a couple of weeks ago the city of Asbestos decided to change its name to. Uh, Like Happy Valley or something, or yeah, the now uh, Val des Monts or something. Yeah, Val des Monts, je pense. So they finally are maybe not hyping up the uh, uh, Quebec pride in asbestos anymore. <laughs> C'est peut-être fini pour l'amiante, en fait, la ville d'asbestos qui a changé de nom tout récemment. Uh, donc, c'est ma petite présentation sur ces formes-là. Juste un petit mot pour dire, um, one thing that's fairly interesting is this notion of sticking a cartridge in was very, very, um, I was a radio DJ in the 80s, 90s, and I still am. And I have to say, I remember this era, and it was very convenient. You stuck the ad in and played instantly. Uh, for a while in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the mini disc uh, more or less replaced the cartridges. Um, you actually had very similar devices where you, you, all you saw was a few slots to stick the mini discs in, and you stick it in, and it would play right away. Um, it was an improvement on these because it, it was a little easier to. Uh, to uh, change out the, uh, uh, the file on it. But that didn't last very long, actually, probably by around 2010. And at this point, probably at every radio station in the world, the way we play ads now is we take the computer mouse and we find the file and we press play on the computer. So it's not as exciting as it used to be, but I guess that's how it goes. C'est uh, maintenant uh, pas des plus excitants de jouer les uh, pubs sur la radio. On, on a plus de cartouches ou de mini disques à rentrer dans la machine pour la faire jouer automatiquement. On doit aller chercher nos annonces euh, sur l'ordinateur et euh, les faire jouer euh, comme n'importe quel autre fichier. Donc, c'est un peu banal. All right, I think we have another... Uh, I think it should be all right. I, I, I might add a little bit more in my next presentation. It'll be a little a bit more fun. And uh, I believe we can switch to Alain Dufour uh, with a second presentation. Donc, euh, la cassette Cousineau, c'était une cassette sans fin qui utilise le même principe que les cassettes euh, 8 pistes et qui d'ailleurs était antérieure à la cassette 8 pistes. Donc, euh, c'est M. Cousineau qui a inventé, si on peut dire, le format de cassette sans fin. Et il y avait au départ des durées très limitées, de 3 minutes ou 6 minutes, et par la suite, il y a eu des formats beaucoup plus longs euh, qui permettaient d'enregistrer des albums au complet. Les formats courts étaient utilisés pour faire des annonces publicitaires dans les magasins, dans le système euh, euh, d'intercom du magasin où on annonçait les spéciaux de la journée, des choses comme ça. Euh, et ils étaient utilisés aussi pour un appareil assez particulier qui s'appelle le dormiphone qui est un lecteur donc de ruban magnétique et qui euh, pouvait être programmé à différents moments de la journée donc sur le devant de l'appareil il y a une horloge qu'on peut avec des, des petits ergots qu'on peut enclencher pour que l'appareil se mette en marche automatiquement à différents moments de la journée et fasse jouer la cassette, euh, le message qui est sur la cassette, qui pouvait être donc euh, des leçons, euh, des cours de langue ou euh, des répliques de théâtre, quoi que ce soit, qu'on voulait apprendre. Et c'était assez... Euh, on, on pouvait apprendre ça comment? On pouvait l'apprendre en dormant, donc on enclenchait la machine 
où on la programmait pour qu'elle démarre différents moments de la nuit. Et on mettait sous notre oreiller un petit écouteur euh, plat, comme ça, qu'on peut mettre sous, sous l'oreiller pour entendre euh, les, euh, ce qu'il y avait sur le ruban, finalement, pendant la nuit. Donc, on a déjà ici les instructions d'origine, comment étudier en dormant, évidemment comment enregistrer les messages, et en fait tout le fonctionnement de, de l'appareil, et ainsi que le, la programmation qui pouvait être réglée pour un démarrage à toutes les 15 minutes. Donc je vais le brancher. Et là, évidemment, il s'agit d'un appareil à lampe, donc il faut attendre quelques secondes pour que les lampes soient réchauffées. Évidemment, on a aussi un microphone pour enregistrer notre propre message. Donc, contrairement à une cassette de 8 pistes qu'on va juste insérer ici, il fallait soulever le dispositif. Casser la cassette et en enclenchant, ça devrait jouer. Alors, évidemment, ce qui se passe, c'est que les galets de caoutchouc sont usés. Euh, et le ruban pas toujours avancé comme ça devrait. En plus, je pense que cette cassette-là est un peu abîmée. Il manque un ressort. Donc, j'ai dû faire une petite réparation. Ça fait partie des problèmes avec des vieux appareils. Euh, vous allez remarquer qu'ici, le... j'ai rajouté une épaisseur de caoutchouc qui vient d'une chambre à air de vélo pour augmenter la largeur de, du galet de caoutchouc qui est usé et ici j'ai dû mettre une petite pièce de plastique par dessus le comment on l'appelle donc le cabestan là aussi pour augmenter donc la, la dimension et augmenter la friction donc maintenant on devrait avoir un enchaînement plus intéressant Donc là, on voit bien que la cassette est en mouvement. Il n'y a pas beaucoup d'enregistrement là-dessus. Donc, si je veux faire la programmation de l'appareil pour la nuit, je l'ai mis sur automatique versus manuel. Et euh, donc, là, il est 7 heures moins quart. Donc, si je j'enclenche le 7 heures, 7 heures et 45 minutes, ça devrait décoller. Pardon, 6h45, on va lire comme il faut. Donc, c'est 6h45. Bon. Donc, il n'était peut-être pas tout à fait 6h45. Donc, à 6h30. Et, demi, et euh, là, le, le système se met en marche. Évidemment, la bobine est presque vide, donc on ne peut pas vraiment entendre. Et si on branche l'écouteur, ben, on pourrait mettre l'écouteur sous l'oreiller, puis entendre les messages. 